This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. My name is Dustin Smith, and as always, I will be your host. This week, we have episode 321, entitled, Jesus' Solidarity with Human Mortality in Hebrews. So this week's episode, I want to discuss a newly published article in the journal entitled Novum Testamentum. That's New Testament in Latin. And the issue number is 66. So this article was published at the beginning of this year, 2024, and it is titled Jesus' Solidarity with Human Mortality and Perfection of Sonship in the Epistle to the Hebrews. If you want to go looking for the article, it's actually on pages 95 through 111, and the author's name is G. Yi Lee. So when I saw the title of this particular article, I knew I had to read it because I was sure that the author of this article was going to be saying something about Jesus as a genuine human being, as a real man, as a member of the human race within the book of Hebrews. This is, of course, one of the main tenets of biblical Unitarian theology. And the article basically argues that there is a substantial connection between the theme of sonship in chapter 12 of Hebrews, which focuses on the discipline of the readers, and the theme of sonship in chapter 1, which highlights the discipline of Jesus. So both the readers of Hebrews and the Son of God are portrayed by the author of Hebrews, as entrusting their lives to God in obedience, which results in the promise of a received inheritance. So if this article is correct, and I think its observations are fairly sound, then this suggests that Jesus, in the letter to the Hebrews, is a human being just like the obedient readers of Hebrews are genuine human beings. So how does Jesus act as a forerunner for the readers according to the narrative of Hebrews? In what ways has the author of Hebrews framed the Son of God and the original readers in order to pair them with shared acts of faithful obedience to God? And How does the exhortation in Hebrews chapter 12 help us make sense of the quotation from Psalm 45 in regard to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9? Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today is looking at the discipline of the Son of God and of the readers of Hebrews. So I want to read some passages in chapter 1, and then I want to read the main passage in chapter 12, and I want to discuss how these two passages are actually related. They actually complement one another. The description about Jesus and the discipline that he had to go through anticipates the discipline and the obedience that we're going to see in chapter 12. And, of course, chapter 12 is going to begin by talking about Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, and that indicates that he is functioning as a forerunner. So let's read these passages. Starting in chapter 1, verse 4, it talks about Jesus as having become as much greater than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And then in verses 8 through 9 of chapter 1, it says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, 
has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So that's the description of Jesus in chapter 1. So that's verses 4 and then 8 through 9. And of course, verses 8 through 9 is a quotation from Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7. Now let's look at how that description of Jesus actually anticipates the language in chapter 12. So starting in verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the forerunner and perfecter of faith who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Quote, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. End quote. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of Spirits and live. For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. That's Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 11. And so you can see that this long description about the need for the readers to function as sons, not just of their earthly fathers, but sons of God, namely God being defined as the Father alone, that of course demonstrates that God is one person, the Father alone. And the call is for these readers to function as sons of the Father and to submit to his discipline because although it might not be joyful, it will actually lead to righteousness. And the beginning of this tells the readers to set their eyes on Jesus. And it describes Jesus as the forerunner. He is the perfecter of faith. And it shows how he submitted to God. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And eventually he was rewarded with an inheritance. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The readers are called to consider him, namely consider Jesus, who has endured such hostility so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. So Jesus and the way that he dealt with his own mortality, and the fact that he actually died, but of course he was raised from the dead and exalted, and he inherited a name much greater than the angels. Jesus functions as the author, this word that is probably more accurately translated as the forerunner. He is the forerunner and the perfecter of faith. But what we need to do is we need to look at the specific words the specific words that the author uses to connect the experience of Jesus in chapter 1 
with the experience of the readers, the sons of the Father, in chapter 12. And in doing so, we will see how this particular article makes the case that Jesus' own solidarity with his humanity is intended to function as the forerunning example for other human beings looking at their own mortality and that the way that they're supposed to respond in obedience to God is set by the example of Jesus. This moves us to our second point. Point number two, the thematic connections between Jesus and the readers of Hebrews. So the first connection that the author of this article points out is gladness and joy. And he points to the quotation of Psalm 45 in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. Now, I know there's some debate among Unitarians as to whether it is the throne that is described as God or whether it is the Son being described as God, as in a title that's given to Jesus in the same way that the title was given to the Davidic king in Psalm 45. But I think that the latter is going to make much more sense with the way that this is described. So in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, which is quoting from Psalm 45, verse 7, it says that you, in reference to the Son, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And the companions there indicates the human companions. We know that the readers of Hebrews are the companions of Jesus. The same Greek word appears in chapter 3, verse 14. But notice here is that God has anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness. Jesus now has gladness because, specifically, he chose to love righteousness and hate lawlessness. So, God anoints Jesus with gladness far above his companions. Jesus is exalted because of his obedience, because of his righteous behavior, and because he hated lawlessness. So we have this word gladness here. Now, in chapter 12, verse 2, we're going to have a similar word, the word joy, but this is going to start off talking about Jesus. So in chapter 12, verse 2, it says, of course, fixing our eyes on Jesus the forerunner and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's chapter 12, verse 2. So Jesus had this joy that was set before him, and because of that, he endured the cross, he died, he suffered in his mortality, he ignored the shame, and he was rewarded with the inheritance of being exalted to the right hand of God. Now, that same word for joy, the Greek word kara, appears in reference to the description of the readers, down in verse 11 of the same chapter, where it says, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, same word as we saw in chapter 12, verse 2, but sorrowful, yet To those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So chapter 12, verse 11. So in 12, verse 2, Jesus has the joy that's set before him, and that led him to endure the cross and to suffer as a mortal human being, resulting in his inheritance. The believers are also supposed to see the joy in front of them, It's going to be difficult. They're going to have to suffer. It's going to be sorrowful, actually. It doesn't seem joyful, but it actually will be. And those who are trained by this discipline, it is going to lead to righteousness. But the quotation from Psalm 45 indicates not the word joy, but it indicates the word gladness. Now, the word for gladness there is agaliasis. But the word for joy in 12 verse 2 and 12 verse 11 is the word kara. However, these words are synonymous in several places in the New Testament. So like Luke chapter 1 verse 14, where it says, You will have joy and gladness, 
and many will rejoice at his birth. That's Luke chapter 1, verse 14, where both words appear right next to each other, and they're meant to complement each other. But the verbal forms of gladness and joy appear as synonyms in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, and Revelation 19, verse 7. So even though that we have a different word used for Jesus' gladness in chapter 1, verse 9, than what we have in chapter 12, it's clear that the same word joy appears for Jesus in 12, verse 2, and in 12, verse 11. So there's a thematic connection involving the gladness and joy that was set before Jesus that motivated him to love righteousness and to hate lawlessness, and therefore he attained to that joy. He attained to that gladness. God anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness. That actually makes sense as to why the author of Hebrews is citing Psalm 45, not just verse 6, but also verse 7. And it anticipates the joy and gladness that Jesus set before him in chapter 12, verse 2, which allows Jesus to function as the forerunner of those who have the discipline of the Lord, which is not initially joyful, but those that have been trained by it will see that joy leading to righteousness. The author of the article says this, quote, In summary, even though Hebrews 12 does not explicitly mention the term agaliasis, the Old Testament background against which the author develops his discussion of chapter 12 shows the concept of eternal joy that will be given to the people of God after the period of endurance with trust in God. The discussion of the Son in Hebrews chapters 1 through 2 deals with the same concept of joy that the Son could obtain through his choice of righteousness, which plausibly refers to his trust in the Father even in the situation of suffering. It is a plausible inference that the author of Hebrews saw the same theological idea of exaltation and restoration of the people of God in the imagery of the anointing of the oil of joy in both Psalm 45 and Isaiah text. End quote. Let's look at the second connection between Jesus and the readers, and that is the word righteousness. Hopefully you've seen this or you've caught this on. We've seen in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, that because Jesus loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God, his God, anointed him with the oil of gladness. Okay, So Jesus loved righteousness. Jesus loved doing his part of the covenant obedience. And because of his love for righteousness, he endured the cross and he suffered and God elevated Jesus and exalted companions. Now in chapter 12, verse 11, we've already read that all discipline for the moment seems to not be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of, you guessed it, righteousness. So Jesus loved righteousness, and that led to his obedient stance and his suffering and his death. And the believers are to submit to the discipline of the Lord. And once they've been trained by it, it will yield the fruit of righteousness. So they would love righteousness in the same way that Jesus loved righteousness. That same word, the noun vikaiosini in Greek, connects the behavior of Jesus the human being with the behavior of the human readers of Hebrews. This is what the author of the article has to say about this connection. The second concept, which shows the connection between Hebrews chapters 1 through 2 and 12, is righteousness, which has been introduced above as having a close correlation with the concept of joy. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, the Son is described as obtaining the exaltation as the consequence of his choice of righteousness. And in Psalm 45 and Psalm 21, the righteousness plausibly refers to his trust in God. 
who will save him from his enemies in the time of trouble. Hebrews chapter 12 presents the idea that the sons who have been trained by the father's discipline have the fruit of peace produced from righteousness. Chapter 12, verse 11. The righteousness in the text is clearly related to their proper response to the father's discipline. Chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. Which is granted for legitimate heirs. Chapter 12, verse 8. In light of the message of Isaiah 35, Hebrews' emphasis on the son's proper response to the divinely planned hardship becomes more explicit. They need to keep trusting in and depending only on God in the face of current threats of their enemies, which might put their lives in danger. In other words, the way in which the son was anointed with the oil of gladness finally aligns with how the sons obtain joy from the father's discipline. That is to say, by choosing righteousness, by choosing trust in God in the situation of suffering, which particularly causes the fear of death. So the third connection between Jesus and the readers of Hebrews that are submitting to the discipline of the Lord is, of course, the promised inheritance. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, it says that Jesus, having become much greater than the angels, inherited a much more excellent name than they. So Jesus inherited a much more excellent name than the angels after his death and resurrection. So he has received that inheritance. And of course, in chapter 1, verse 9, again pointing this out, because Jesus loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, God therefore anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness above Jesus' companions. So Jesus was elevated above his companions. He was anointed with that gladness specifically because he responded by loving righteous behavior and shunning lawless behavior. So that is an act of receiving an inheritance. He was exalted above his companions. Now you might think, wait a minute, I haven't seen the language of inheriting in Hebrews chapter 12. Well, we have to read a little bit more closely. So in chapter 12, verses 5 through 6, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. And then he's quoting here from Proverbs chapter 3. Quote, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So that's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 6. And this is quoting from Proverbs chapter 3. And the conclusion of Proverbs chapter 3, if you go back and you read this quotation in its context there in Proverbs 3, verses 11 through 12, the conclusion of Proverbs 3 says this in the final verse. The wise will inherit honor. Proverbs 3, verse 35. So Hebrews chapter 12 is quoting from a passage that talks about the discipline that the sons of Yahweh are supposed to submit to, and that if they go through this discipline, it indicates the love that Yahweh is showing towards his sons. And it concludes by saying that these wise sons will find honor to be their inheritance. They will inherit honor. And so we have Jesus inheriting his exalted status and inheriting a much more excellent name than the angels because he submitted to the discipline of God. He submitted to righteous behavior, his trust and his obedience to God, and the disciples are supposed to do the same. And in doing so, there's a quote from Proverbs chapter 3 that in its own context concludes that section in Proverbs 3 with a promise that the wise will certainly inherit honor. The author of the article says, the message of Hebrews chapter 12 is clear. Only those sons who followed the father's will and were properly disciplined 
by keeping faith in and depending on God in the situation of suffering will be granted the inheritance of the Father. So in sum, this article rightly draws attention to an overlooked thematic connection in Hebrews, which connects the obedient suffering, discipline, and rewarded inheritance of Jesus, the Son of God, with the believers, namely the ideal readers of the book of Hebrews. By explaining the oppression and persecution that the believers have experienced in light of the Father's discipline, the author of Hebrews encourages continued faithfulness and promises joy and an inheritance for those who do so. During this process of moral exhortation, Jesus is set as the forerunner, the one who first suffered as a truly mortal person, resulting in joy, gladness, and his inheritance. The human Jesus demonstrated this way of perfection when he learned obedience through the suffering of death, and he was exalted to the right hand of God. The connection between Jesus, the Son of God, and the believers, in addition to the title forerunner given to Jesus in chapter 12, verse 2, only makes sense if Jesus, in Hebrews, is a human being, a genuine man, a member of the human race just like the readers of Hebrews are human persons. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Join us next week as we examine the two powers in heaven within biblical scholarship. What is all the drama surrounding the two powers in heaven, and what does the evidence actually reveal about what believers in the first century CE were teaching and believing. Please look forward to our next episode where we begin our exploration of the two powers in heaven. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us as we aim to promote the sound truths about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. You can support us absolutely for free by subscribing on YouTube or iTunes, by giving us an honest review online, and by sharing your favorite episodes with your friends. If you'd like to offer a donation, please check out the episode description for a PayPal link, or you can have a membership to the YouTube channel. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is produced and edited by Dustin Williams. I am Dustin Smith, your host. Until next time, please take care.